Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, so, is there any question? No. Next week we have the midterm exam, right? Yeah. So, uh, uh, is there any question about the assignment about the exam? Hi. Is there any question about the midterm exam? <laughs> yeah, feel free to ask me offline as well. Okay. But if you have any question that you want everyone to know the answer, let me know here now. Uh, okay. Where did I say it is? Let me check the course link. Do you remember the deep learning? So the midterm exam. It says the exam materials will be until the end of regularization. Yeah. The, here I announced that you will not have regularization because we haven't yet started that. I think we will go over that to today, but you don't have enough time to go to study that. So I exclude that. Okay. So uh, I think maybe we can say until the end of CNN. Is it good? Yeah. Until the end of the end of convolutional neural network. Uh, is there any other question? Yeah. Yeah. But you don't have any like sample questions. Yes. <laughs> I I was I was thinking to put a similar question in assignment two because if I don't do that, then assignment two will not have enough materials to be asked for. But you want a sample question on that? Uh, let me think. Hard. Then what do I do for assignment two then? <laughs> if it is absolutely necessary, I can put a, a sample question on uh, about convolution. Is it absolutely necessary? Yeah. Okay, sure. I can put, but I need time. Okay. Uh, I, I may do it a bit close to the exam, but I will do that. Okay, sure. No problem. If I forget, please re remind me. Okay. Thank you. Any other question? No? Yeah, I think your exam will be straightforward. Just try to practice. And, and yeah, uh, you know that it's open book, right? You don't need to memorize anything. Okay. So any question about the course materials? You know, here we study not to, for the exam, but for enjoying the course, right? So try to enjoy. Even when you are doing the exam, try to enjoy the exam. Have you had such perspective toward the exams? <laughs> try to enjoy the exam. So, okay, uh, let's, let's continue. In the previous session, do you remember, uh, we talked about important, so we finished CNN and then we talked about important um, uh, convolutional neural networks, including ResNet. What did we cover? ResNet, UNet. In the previous session, we covered Inception, GoogleNet, AlexNet. Uh, these things. Do you remember VGG? Also, LeNet was covered. So now let's continue. Uh, there were one or two more important CNN network uh, that we are going to cover. One of them is DenseNet. Yeah, I think DenseNet is the last one, maybe. Uh, DenseNet, empirically, it, it is observed that convolutional neural networks can become deeper, more accurate, and efficient to train if there exists shorter connections between the initial layers and the last layer. Right. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm... So can you guess why 
So empirically, they saw that if we have shortcut connections between the first layers and the last layers, it works well. But can you guess why? Okay. I I agree with your statement, but the, is it sparser here? It's the other way around. It's denser, right? We are adding layers. So con consider exclude these. It becomes like a fully connected or a, a com simple convolution neural network, simple. But now we are adding these. That's fine. Please say get your guesses if it is wrong that, that that's completely okay. Yeah. Yeah. Some information loss from the start to the end. Information what? I think you're in a right track. So one answer might be you are kind of copying or transferring the information from initial layers to the last layer, but you can see it in the other way around. Let me tell you what. When you want to train the network, what do you do? You do backpropagation, right? And we know that in backpropagation, we have chain rule, multiplication of the probabilities. Sorry, the gradients, I apologize. Multiplication of uh, gradients. And what happens if the gradients are small? It, we will have gradient vanishing, right? If they are big, we'll have gradient explosion, right? Because multiplication of large numbers becomes too large. Large multiplication of small numbers becomes too small. However, when we have these, what happens? The, the, uh, the gradient flow in the back propagation can, can go from here rather than here. From this side, we'll have a lot of multiplications. But from this side, Gradients can have a shortcut. So in the gradient flow, as a result, will not face the problem of gradient vanishing and gradient explosion, right? The same idea was in the ResNets. In ResNet. But here, rather than ResNet residual blocks, you are having shortcuts between the first layers and the last layers, long shortcuts, right? And hi. so in dense convolutional network or dense net in short, every layer is connected to every other layer. So they exaggerated this. They said, let's connect every layer to every other layer. In a regular network with L layers, the number of weight matrices is L uh, as every layer is connected to its next subsequent layer, okay? So we have L layers, for example. How many weight matrices do we have? L, right? So for example, for one layer, how many weight matrices does it have? One, right? Two layers, two weight matrices. Do you remember? So now in the regular network with L layers, we have L weight matrices. In dense net, however, there are L times L plus one over two weight matrices between the layers. As every layer is connected to all its next layers. When I say here, I said, all layers are connected to each other. Here I said all layers are connected to their next layers. Are they contradictory? No, they are the same thing. When every layer is connected to its next layers, it means that all layers are connected to each other, right? So, and that's why we have L over L plus one, uh, L times L plus one over two. So you can see how many cases, to, because it's symmetric when we say, Layer one is connected to layer two. Layer two is also connected to layer one. That's the reason. Uh, so basically, it's like L L cases, but only one lower lower or upper tri triangular cases we have because the other one is symmetric. This one is symmetric, like this. So okay. So uh, here you see the figure for the dense set, by the way. As you see, they are connected to each other. We have a lot of connections, okay? Now, the benefits of dense net. So it's, it alleviates the gradient vanishing problem, according to what I just explained, right? Because we have skips 
uh, or shortcuts for gradient flow. This is because in backpropagation, gradient can flow directly through all layers to every other pre previous layers. A strengthen feature propagation, kind of what you, you said. So we propagate features to each other. Encourage feature reuse. So let's uh, reuse different features again and again, all right? Reduce the number of learnable parameters. Isn't it contradictory? We are adding layers. We are adding layer. We are adding weights between layers. How is it saying that we are reducing the number of learnable parameters or the weights? We are increasing, right? But why is it saying so? This is because assume I add uh, weights between the layers. In this case, I'm having a lot of additional weights, right? As a result, for having deep learning, I don't need to make my network too deep. So I can compensate the depth of the uh, network with its width, kind of, by adding the weights, right? When I do that, overall, the number of learnable parameters becomes smaller. Do you remember VGG? They exaggerated in, in terms of the depth of the network. In Densnet, they said, what, why do you do that? Increase the width of the network by increasing the weights between the layers. You don't need to go too, too deep, right? Densnet requires less number of layers than regular ne networks. It has already enough learn uh, learnable parameters between the layers. And learnable parameter means weights, right? Let FLX denote the composite function of batch normalization. Okay. So what do I mean by composite function? Uh, do you remember in high school we had f of g of x? We could write it as f o g x, right? You remember? So when several functions are stacked back to back, we said composite function. Let's now assume I have batch normalization, convolution, ReLU activation function. I denote it as f l x, right? In the layer L, in the layer L. Maybe also pooling, right? Then this is in ResNet. Do you remember this is in ResNet? In ResNet, we had XL minus one. We add it to the output of the ResNet module. Do you remember? Let's go back to the ResNet for you to remember. This is what we had in ResNet, equation four, right? The input of FX is added to the output of FX to give us the HX. Here exactly we have it in this figure as well. So then set came after ResNet. Maybe re reviewers said, how is it different from ResNet? This is how it is different. So the, the author said, equation five is ResNet, right? However, in DenseNet, we, we use uh, the concatenation of outputs of all previous layers at every layer, not just one block, right? So as you see, we concatenate all of them, x0 to xl minus one, all of the previous one, and then we feed it to fl. As you see, obviously these two are different. Did you understand? Okay. So in other words, it uses direct connections from each layer to all subsequent layers. And as a result, all layers will be connected to each other. Any question? No. So DenseNet is composed of several, several dense blocks, where in each dense block, every layer is connected to all its subsequent layers. So now we talked about that now, consider it as blockwise. So in every block, they connect all layers to each other, right? And then they stack these blocks to each other. There are transition layers between the dense blocks which perform convolution followed by pooling. So basically this is input. We have convolution, then we feed it to the dense block one. As you see, all layers are connected to each other. Then this is transition layer, convolution followed by pooling. Then we go to dense block two, Again, convolution, pooling. Then splat three, convolution, pooling. Finally, prediction. This is the final structure of the dense net, okay? So now, in the dense blocks, the composite function FLX spe specifically consists of batch normalization 
So every uh, the composite function that we have. It has batch normalization, three by three convolution, ReLU activation function. As you see from, uh, I think, uh, AlexNet, until now, they are usually using ReLU activation function in the hidden layers, right? Every transition layer consists of batch normalization, one by one convolution. Why do we use one by one convolution? How is it useful? Do you remember? We talked about it in the previous session. Do you remember? So one by one... I understand three by three convolution, but what does one by one convolution do? So three by three convolution, do you remember in the CNN lecture? So we multiply the elements of the filter by the pixels behind, we add them up. As we said, we will have some sample question on that. So, but now reduce the size of the filter to one. What, what does it do? So it multiply the filter value to its pixel behind and outputs. So it becomes a linear projection. It's a linear transformation, right? <clears throat> also average pooling with width two. The last transition layer, however, is an average pooling followed by a linear layer, okay? Why do we need linear layer at the end? Because can you tell me what is the shape of data or features here before the linear layer? What? Matrix, like an image, right? Maybe 2D or uh, 2D with maybe rows and columns, maybe with several uh, channels, right? We have to flatten it to become like a fully connected because we need to do prediction, right? For example, we want to use cross entropy. So we we have to have a fully connected layer at the end. Do you remember Linet also had the same idea, had a fully connected layer at the end, agree? Okay, and we use softmax activation function whose number of neurons is the number of classes. Do you remember? Because we wanna use cross entropy, for example. In the dense block, every convolution has some number of channels, obviously, because it's convolutional layer. The number of channels is named growth rate in the paper of DenseNet. They named it. They probably they wanted to make it fancy to be accepted. <laughs> the elf layer in a dense block has k0 plus k times l minus one input features, feature maps, where k0 is the number of channels in the input data, and k is the growth rate in all previous layers inside the block. Do you know why, first off, why do they call it growth rate? Because of this exactly. So how many feature maps do we have for the elf layer in a dense block? So K0 feature maps is already from the input layers, right? Because input layer is also connected to this layer, elf layer. Also, in each layer, assume I have k, uh, I have k feature maps, right? K is the growth rate. And how many previous layers do I have in this dense block? L minus one, because this, I'm in the elf layer, right? So k times L minus one plus k zero, which was the input channels, for example, three RGB, right? This is the total number of channels for the elf layer, of course, when we go deeper and deeper in a dense block, the number of input channels for that layer increases, right? That's the reason they called it growth rate. It is growing. Okay. It, it is empirically observed that a small growth rate, for example, K equals 12, is sufficient for denseness. I remember last semester I also said that to me, it's not a small. But to them, apparently, it's a small because they have a lot of resources. Okay. But, okay, anyway. And these are the references. We covered important convolutional neural networks. A any question? So we covered what? LeanNet, AlexNet, VGG, ResNet, DenseNet, Inception, Google Net, 
all of these, right? And the most famous one nowadays we use is simple uh, simple convolution neural network, which is almost linear with some modifications, and ResNet, right? By the way, if you want to try ResNet for your projects, don't go over ResNet 18, right? Because your computer will blow up or you will have memory error, right? Re above ResNet 32 above, they are for servers, okay? Don't try Res I remember last semester, some a group told me that they, uh, one of uh, their laptop died because of <laughs> running ResNet 34 or something, okay? I don't want you to lose laptops. To run. Okay. Where were we? Okay, now, now it's time to go to regularization. Before regularization in deep learning, let me quickly review the overfitting. Do you remember at the start of semester, I asked you to review overfitting? Lecture, I hope you have. Now I assume that you have studied that. So I go faster on this one. Okay, I go faster on overfitting and, but feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. So first we review overfitting cross-validation and regularization in general machine learning. And then we go to regularization just for deep learning. Okay. So measures for mod, by the way, uh, I have videos on my YouTube channel with more depth. So you can feel free to watch those. I also sent you a, a link for that. So uh, assume we have a function f, which gets the ith input xi and outputs fi, which is f of xi. By the way, what is this f? Why do I say with question mark and this box? Again, recall what I told you about theory of forms or ideas by Plato. Do you remember? So I, let me uh, recall it. So I said, Plato said that whatever we see in this world as a true form or idea or maybe essence in another uh, logical world called the world of forms, right? And we are just instances of that. And uh, by the way, some people, some philosophers after that extended the idea saying that we have also some universals, which is shared between these things. For example, color is a universal. Thing. So table itself doesn't have color. The idea of table doesn't have any color. Color is universal shared between us. Shape also. The, the table or desk, whatever we call it. Table doesn't have shape, a true, true table, right? Shape is a universal. Did you get it? So this is a difference between universal. Uh, I forgot the opposite, the name of the opposite of universal. Universal, particular. So we have particulars and universals. For more information, just YouTube uh, epistemology. And you will see there are a lot of things on that. So. Why did I say that? Because in machine learning, we can see that, we can assume that every machine learning model has a true idea of, right? But we can never reach that. We try to estimate it, try to estimate. So F, we don't, we hope that we have F. If we have F, everything is perfect. This world is full of imperfectness, right? So now let's estimate it by F hat. We have F hat, we implement F hat. Okay, so xi is our data, we have it. We feed xi to the logical f, which we don't have. It gives us f of xi or fi, but we don't have f because we don't have f. But we have f hat, so we can feed xi to f hat. By the way, train f hat by xi as well. And the prediction of uh, xi by the f hat we call it y i hat, okay? Also called f i hat, doesn't matter. We can denote it by f i hat or y i hat. What is y i? Y i is the la actual label in the data set for x i. But what is that? That's the f i, which we don't have, plus some noise. 
right? Plus some noise. Why, why do we have noise? Because maybe the people who measured the data did some mistake, right? So this is what we have. As a result, yi is fi plus epsilon i, where epsilon i is some Gaussian noise, which is the most understandable noise for our measures with mean zero and variance sigma squared. Why should mean be zero? Because what is the mean of uh, yi, expectation of yi? Is expectation of fi plus expectation of epsilon i, right? Because expectation is a linear operator. So I want expectation of yi to be expectation of fi, right? As a result, this must be zero, which is the mean of noise, okay? Otherwise, I will have some bias always. So now, this is what we had. This is the noise as there's expectation of AI, epsilon i is zero. What is X? Do you remember recall preliminaries for this formula? Expectation of epsilon i is squared is related to variance also, which is sigma squared because this is zero. What is expectation of fi? F is fi random? If I, fi is what we have, with what we have in the world of forms, we don't have access to. Fi doesn't change. Fi is fixed, right? Fi doesn't have any noise. So it's just, it's not a stochastic. Expectation of fi is fi itself, right? The input training data, x1 to xn, and their corrupted observations, corrupted by noise, I mean, there are y1 to yn, are available, right? We would like to approximate the true model by the model f hat, as I said. Okay. Calling, so, we want yi hat to be as close as possible to yi, right? This is exactly what we do in training, right? What do we do in training usually in machine learning? So we have actual labels, yi, and some predicted labels, yi hat, and we want them to be as close as possible. So for example, for regression, we can minimize the mean squared error between these labels. And we know that machine learning and deep learning are always optimization, nothing but optimization, right? So we are minimizing some class function over. Them. So we train the model using the training data in order to estimate the true model. Hopefully it mimics the behavior of the true model. Okay, after training the model, it can be used to estimate the output of the model for both training and test. Assume this is training and I have N training data points and M test data points, right? Okay, so these are the labels, the predicted labels for training and test data respectively. Okay. And recall these, do you remember? This formula, for, uh, recall this from preliminaries lecture. And if we, so now to, from, as a result, I can, I can rewrite this as this, squared square root, right? Also this as this, and this is the same as before. So using Pythagorean theorem, I can write it in this as this. So I, this is a true F that I don't have access to. This is my F hat, which I'm pre, uh, approximating F with, and this is expectation of F hat. Ex, is expectation of F hat F hat? No, F hat is noisy, right? It's random. And these are, what I have, right? If expectation of f hat equals f, the bias will be zero. Okay, mean squared error of estimation of observations. So suppose we have some in data instance, x0, y0, okay? And this instance can be either training or test validation. I assumed, I consider test and validation as the same thing because in both, both of them are not used for training, okay? Training or test and validation. Uh, we will cover both cases later, okay? According to equation one, this was, equ equation one was yi equals fi plus epsilon i. Now, rather than i, I'm having zero, doesn't matter. Uh, y0 equals f0 plus epsilon zero. 
Assume the model's estimation of y0 is f0 hat, right? I said I can either denote it by y0 hat or f0 hat, doesn't matter. Then the mean squared error of this estimation, what is it? This is ex what this is exactly the formula for mean squared error. You don't believe me? This is a so this is error, error difference. This is a squared, and this is mean, right? Mean squared error, right? Now let's replace y0 with equation five. So I'll get this, right? Now I'm gonna use the Binomial th theorem. What is that? Very simple. We learned it in middle school, I believe. A or high school. A plus B squared is A squared plus B squared plus 2AB. Right? So consider this and this. Then it becomes this. Agreed? We know expectation is a linear operator. So I apply it on this. Right? Then what is expectation of epsilon zero squared? We saw that in the previous slides, it's sig sigma squared. Agree? Now, now, the last term, which is this, let's consider it. The last term, rather than epsilon zero, can I put y zero minus f zero? Yes, according to equation five. Rearrange it for epsilon zero. Agreed? By the way, I'm going faster because I'm I'm supposed you're supposed to have watched that. Okay. But feel free to interrupt me. Okay, now two cases might happen. Either the data is in the training or not. Case one, it is not in the training set. It's either test or validation data. Okay. So y zero is not in the training set. This means that the estimation F0 hat is independent of the observation Y0. Do you agree? Does Y0 and X0 are not used for training F hat, right? So F0 hat is independent of that. As a result, they are independent. This is therefore in mathematics, right? They are independent, and this means independent. Don't confuse these two notations. This is independent. This is perpendicular or orthogonal, okay? So they are independent. Now, as a subtract f zero from the sides, so these two are also independent. By the way, why am I allowed to do that? Because f zero is not random, also. So then, as a result, this. By the way, now in these two cases, I'm gonna talk about this equation seven. What happens in these two cases? Okay, so. Here, this is exactly the last term that we are gonna talk about. So what do we do? We know that as these two are independent, when X and Y are independent, expectation of X, Y equals expectation of X times expectation of Y when they are independent, right? So I can write it this, in this way. What is Y zero minus F zero? We can expectation of y zero minus f zero. I can write. We know expectation is a linear operator. Expectation of y zero minus expectation of f zero. What is expectation of y zero? Do you remember? According to equation five, what was y zero? It was f zero plus epsilon zero. So expectation of f zero plus expectation of epsilon zero. This we know that it's not random f zero. It becomes f zero. Expectation of epsilon zero is zero. So it's f zero. So this becomes F0, and we know that the expectation of F0 is also F0. As a result, this is zero. This is zero, everything times zero except infinity is zero. So this is zero, right? Therefore, in this case, what happens? The last term is zero. Then what happens to equation six? Equation six will not have the last term anymore. Which is which becomes equation eight. The mean squared error became simplified to this. Agreed? So this is what we found. I'm repeating it. Now consider rather than one test or validation data instance, let's have M of them. Do you remember M test or validation? M. 
Recall preliminaries. We can approximate expectation by Monte Carlo approximation. Do you remember? Do you remember? As a result, I can approximate this with the Monte Carlo approximation. I have M instances, right? Fi, so rather than F0 hat, I have Fi hat, right? And also Yi rather than Y0. So here also do the Monte Carlo approximation and the sigma squared as before. Then multiply the size by M. You will get this, right? Multiply the size by M. Then the term, this term, this term. What is that? It's the error between the predicted output, if I had, and the label, yi. Yi is the label, right? Which is fi plus epsilon i. Do you remember? So uh, the label and the predicted label, okay, in the data set. So it's the empirical error. We call it, we denote it by a small error, empirical error. What is this? This is the error between the predicted output, but with the true unknown label. We don't know fi. So what is basically between these, the difference between these two? The first one is the error between the predicted label and the, the label actual label in the data set. We call it empirical error denoted by a small error. Denoted by a small error. What is this one? the error between the predicted label and the actual true label, which we never had, right? And uh, Fi, we denoted, it is true error and we denote it by capital error. So as a result, equation nine becomes this, rearrange it, it becomes this. So the true error in this case becomes the empirical error minus M sigma squared, okay? This m sigma squared is a constant and can be ignored. As a result, in this case, the empirical error is a good estimation of the true error. That's why when you go to your manager or when you write a paper, you report your test accuracy and you say, if the test accuracy is good, you will say the model works well because it's showing that the accuracy is the other way around the error, right? So when you say that my Empirical error on the test data is a small, means that the tr your true error, your generalization error is also small. The true error is also called generalization error, right? Now case two, what if the data instance is in the training set? And what happens? So for that, we need to use a formula named Stein's lemma in mathematics, okay? By the way, the first person who connected Stein's lemma to overfitting in my, whatever, according to my search is Professor Ali Potts. He was the first person who connected these two areas together. Stein's lemma to overfitting, okay? So let's see. The instance in, in the, is in the training set. For this case, we use Stein's lemma or, or sure. What is sure? Sure is short for Stein's unbiased risk estimate. Let's see, consider a multivariate random variable. In this slide, I'm just introducing the formula of short. Multivariate random variable Z, which is D-dimensional, okay? Whose components are independent random variables, they are independent with normal distribution. So Zi is normal distribution with mu i and sigma, okay? They are not identically distributed, they are just independent, okay? Then take mu, which is d-dimensional and let g be, be some function applied on the elements of z, okay? So it takes rd and it outputs rd again. Then the Stein's lemma is this. For proof of this lemma, see the appendix in our tutorial paper. You can see we have proved it, okay? If the variable, by the way, the tutorial's name is uh, uh, the theory behind overfitting, cross-validation, regularization, bagging, and boosting tutorial and uh, tutorial. Right. Yeah, that's it. So it's available on archive. If the random variable is a univariate variable, what do I mean? When D is one here, then the Stein's lemma becomes this. 
Just accept this lemma from me. If you want to see the proof, go and see the tutorial paper. Okay, this is a formula. Now we are going to use this formula. You might be why? You might be wondering why. You will see the beauty in a few seconds. Okay, so sure for un univariate variable was this. Now, how can we use that? Now, assume eps. Um, let me think. So Z here in this formula, let it be epsilon zero, the noise, right? Mu, let it be zero. So we can put values in the formula, right? I'm putting uh, z z z epsilon zero for Z, zero for mu. Then uh, what else? For G of Z, which was a function on Z, I let it be F0 hat minus F0, okay? Then put this, what happens to the formula? It becomes this, okay? Agreed? Now, let's simplify the right-hand side. So we know that derivative is a linear operator. So I can apply it on this, right? This derivative. And uh, what happens, let what is the derivative of F0 with respect to epsilon zero? What is that? It's what? Zero. Why? Because F0 doesn't change. Tweak the noise. F0 is true thing which we don't have access to. So we'll have this. Then chain rule. The derivative of F0 hat with respect to epsilon zero, we can write it as multiplication of these two derivatives, right? Now, let's calculate derivative of y0 with respect to epsilon zero. Recall that y0 was f0 plus epsilon zero. So derivative of y0 with respect to epsilon zero is one, right? As a result, this simplifies to this, okay? We haven't yet seen the beauty. We'll see that soon. So therefore, in this case, what happened? This was the last term. Do you remember? The last term became this. As a result, equation six, what was the equation six? The mean squared error. Do you remember? Equation six, the mean squared error. The, the, where was that? Here. The mean squared error. So we simplified the last term. It became equation 13. Right? So this is what we have. Now, again, suppose we have N training data points, N, okay? So we do Monte Carlo approximation. We approximate the expectations by Monte Carlo approximation. We have three expectations this time, right? Now multiply the size by N, it becomes this. Agreed? What is this term? Again, this is empirical error between the a predicted label and the actual label in the data set that we have access to is corrupted by noise. We denote it by a small error. What is this? This is the true error or generalization error, the error between the predicted labels and the actual true labels that we don't have access to, right? So as a result, equation 14 becomes this. Rearrange the terms, it becomes this. But what is it saying? What is it saying? What is this term? So the, the only difference is the last term here, right? When, when uh, the data was the test or validation data, here we had m sigma squared, which is like n sigma squared, n and m are the number of points, right? But the last term is different. So when it is used for training, the last term appears. And what is that? Can you tell me what this is telling me? derivative of f i hat with respect to y i. What is f i hat? My predicted label. What is y i? My true label in the data set. I have access to it, right? So what is the definition of derivative in high school? Exactly, small. So the derivative of Benjamin with respect to table is what? Derivative of Benjamin with respect to table, you want to calculate it. What do you do? You tweak, you move the table, you see how much I move, right? 
This is the derivative of Benjamin with respect to table. Right. So exactly, let's do that. Derivative of fi hat with respect to yi. Change, tweak yi, see how much fi hat changes. What does it mean? Tweak the label in the data set. See how much the predicted output changes. Let's see it in this example in this figure. Consider this point used in the training, right? Okay, used in the training. I move this a little bit toward down. So by the way, this is why here I'm assuming my data is one dimensional and I want a scalar label as well, right? So move the label of this green point a little bit to the down. So it becomes like this, it can't be, becomes here, right? As in figure B. Then see what happens to the prediction, okay? Assume, consider two cases. In these two cases, my prediction is simple, such as linear regression. It's linear, right? This is my prediction. I'm regressing, right? What do I mean by this line? I mean, for this point, for example, for this point, my actual label is here, but my predicted label is here, okay? Compare figures A and B with figures C and D. The C, C and D prediction is very complex. A and B prediction is simple. In both cases, I'm moving my green point, the label of my green point. I see how much the predicted labels change. In the simple case, the change is small. It changes, it moves down the line a little bit. But in the complex case, this is going like this, but here this goes like this, completely different. The behavior becomes, changes completely different, right? So as a result, what is the difference of these two? Figures A, B, and figures C and D. The difference is only in the complexity of the model, right? We just saw that, we just showed by this example that the last term here is a measure of complexity, right? It's a measure of complexity. We, another name for complexity in machine learning is overfitting, okay? When we say the model has become overfit, means that it has become too complex. Okay, they are equivalent, I can say. When it becomes too com complex, what does it mean? It has fitted itself too much to the training data point. When a test data point comes, it can't generalize to that test data point anymore, right? It kind of memorizes. So they are related to each other. Complexity, overfitting, memorization, right? Not, general, not generalization, opposite of generalization. Right. Can you overfit yourself? It's not just for machine learning. Can a human overfit themselves? Yes. Some people study the papers a lot, the different papers. They read a lot. Then initially when they didn't, didn't know too much, they could come up with ideas. But then they study all of the papers. Whenever they come up with some ideas, they said, oh no, I read it somewhere. They don't follow that path anymore. They block themselves. When you read too much, you might block yourself from imagination. So this is overfitting in human. <laughs> okay, interesting. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't study. <laughs> because if you don't study, you will underfit. You should be in balance, right? Balance is important. Also, Buddhism talks about that. Balance is important. Buddha said that. Not underfitting, not overfitting, right? Underfit. <laughs> okay, you are saying underfitting is better than overfitting. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know. But a good fit is good. So in this case, for example, this is underfit. This is over overfit. What is a good fit here? It's this. A good fit is this that I just drew. Right? As you see, behind machine learning, there is philosophy. Okay, so this is, we talked about this, I think. 
So as I said, we have overfitting, we have under, underfitting is also called overgeneralization. Overfitting means too much fitting to the training data. We have good fit in between. In underfitting, what happens? Do I have the plot here? In underfitting, do we have, for example, here? In underfitting, which is this case, this is underfit. This is overfit. This is good fit. In underfitting, we have a small variance. Does this prediction change a lot? No, it's just one line, right? We have a small, low variance. However, we have high bias. What do I mean by high bias? The, the error is too much, right? In overfitting, it's the other way around. We have high variance, low bias. A good case scenario is a middle case scenario. Both bias, bias and variance are almost in a good range, right? So it's a trade-off between bias and variance. Again, another philosophy. You can never reach. Let me explain this a bit. It's important. So in life, whenever you get something, what happens? Let's talk about existential philosophy a little bit. In life, whenever you get something, what happens? You lose something, you lose something else. It's, ne it's never possible that you get something and you ne lose nothing, right? I think both Hinduism and Buddhism also talk about that. You can never reach something but lose other things. So there is always trade-off in life. There is always trade-off in that. And we know that Galileo once said something important. They didn't take him seriously at that time. He said the language of the world is mathematics. And I think it's true. That's why you can write, you can explain everything in life with physics, right? Physics is uh, applying mathematics on whatever we see. So I just said that in life, we know that by, by experiments, we have seen that there is a trade-off. Right? Whatever we get, we lose something. As a result, according to Galileo, in mathematics, whatever we get, we lose something. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed this phenomenon in mathematics? Whenever you get something in mathematics, you lose something. Because mathematics is equivalent to life. For example, in deep learning. Deep learning. Pre before deep learning, like PCA and these things, they could be applied on simple data, right? Simple data, small data. So the data must be simple and small. Then we develop deep learning. It can handle big data and complex data. So something good happens. But a wise idea knows that we, have, we must have lost something. What have we lost in deep learning? Accuracy, accuracy has improved because complexity has improved. But we have lost the speed, the speed of training. PCA is trained in five seconds. Deep learning, you need to train for days or maybe months, right? So there is a trade-off between speed maybe and accuracy or big data. Do we, can we handle big data or not? In optimization, sometimes we optimize we find the closed form solution very fast. Sometimes we do it iteratively. You see this trade off everywhere in mathematics. Okay, let me close this parenthesis of philosophy and continue. <laughs> okay. Cross validation. So, in simple words, I believe that whatever they have talked about in Buddhism, Hinduism, and philosophy, they can be modeled mathematically. They can be modeled mathematically. So, Cross validation. Uh, in order to either find out until which complexity, until which complexity we should train the model or tune the parameters of the model, we should use cross validation. Okay, we should use cross validation to, for tuning the hyperparameters. What do I mean by hyperparameter? So, machine learning model has some parameters to train, but when a, sometimes algorithms have hyperparameters to tune. Hyperparameters are 
tuned or set by the user, okay? But the parameters are learned by optimization. That's the difference, okay? By the way, let me tell you one more important thing. I believe these are important. You might think that these are not related to machine learning, but I, I believe that they are. Again, an existential philosophy that we know that. So what do we have in, ex there are four things that are important in existential philosophy according to Erwin Yalu. okay? One of them is death. One of them is loneliness. The other one is freedom because freedom brings responsibility. And the other one is meaning of life. These four things, okay? For more information, read the book, Existential Psychotherapy, I believe, am I right? Existential Psychotherapy, okay. So by Erwin Yalu. Uh, my the, the thing that I wanna talk about is freedom. Freedom, humans are always scared of freedom. Why? You might think that they are, they are following freedom, but sometimes they are scared of freedom because freedom brings responsibility. Freedom brings responsibility. But how is it related to machine learning? Whenever you design some algorithm, don't put too much freedom for the user. That would be the flaw of your algorithm. Why deep learning has won the world of AI nowadays? There are a lot of reasons. First off, it's a monster. I have talked about it. It's a stack of different machine learning algorithms, right? Another reason is that it can handle big data and complex nonlinear data. But there is another reason too. It doesn't give too much freedom to the user. It says, do give me whatever you want and I will train myself. We don't need to tune too much. We don't need to choose a kernel function. We don't need to choose these hyperparameters. I only have a few hyperparameters and those are learning rate, batch size, and these things, only a few. I will do the rest. And another thing you might say, no, deep learning has a lot of hyperparameters. I will tell you even, for example, the number of layers, the number of neurons, I will say, Usually deep learning is so much monster that when you change this, the accuracy doesn't change a lot. So for example, you change learning rate a little bit, it works well. You change it a little bit again, it works well. So basically, although you, you might think you might uh, hallucinate that you have uh, hyperparameters in deep learning, but you don't have hyperparameters too much. And that's a good thing about deep learning. If deep learning had given responsibility to the users, it wouldn't be used a lot in the industry because I'm scared of responsibility. I don't wanna fail in the project and the manager will fire me, right? Right. So that's another thing that was important about hyperparameters. Don't put too many hyperparameters for your algorithm. So now we have training, uh, so we have training and test denoted by T and R. Later I will add validation as well, okay? So if I have only training and test, their union becomes the whole data D, they shouldn't have any overlap. And uh, we can have various types of cross-validation. One of them is K-fold cross-validation. The other one is leave one out cross-validation or L-O-O-C-V, I think. I have talked about them. Yes, k-fold cross-validation. What does it mean? Divide your data into k partitions. They usually have the same size. The, their union becomes the whole data and they are mutually disjointed. They don't have any overlap, okay? Then what do we do? So we have, yes, as shown in this algorithm, we have a for loop over k, Okay, by the way, K is usually, I have said it here, usually 10. It can be two, five, 10. Usually use 10, 10 for classification, especially when your data is big enough. If you don't use 10, by the way, in the middle of the theory, I'm telling you my, ex my experience in industry and research also. If we don't put 10, the reviewers will get suspicious. Why? Why did you use five? Maybe you didn't good, good, uh, get good result on tenfold cross. Okay, ten is the default. Uh, so this is the algorithm. 
for uh, you have a for loop over the partitions of the data. Then take one of the partitions, the case partition as a test and the rest as a training. What is this notation? It's subtraction for sets. Okay. This means D minus R basically. Okay. This notation. Then use T for training and then feed the test data to the trained model and get the error. This is true error. Why? Because I'm this is the error of the test. And I didn't use this test for training. But now I have k errors, right? Which is a final error. I should aggregate them somehow. How? I can get the mean, the average. The average of the errors is the uh, uh, my final error. OK? What is leave one out cross validation? It's when you don't have too many data points. Assume the size of the, the, your data, which is n, is a small. Then, for example, you have 10 data points or 20 data points, 20 data points. If you apply 10-fold cross-validation, what does it mean? Divide 20 by 10, your test data set will have two points only. And you will have 18 points for training. It's not too much. You, you will have a lot of variance of estimation, right? As a result, you do leave one out cross-validation. It's better to do that because in what is the philosophy behind leave one out cross validation? You want to use most of your data as much as possible for training. Because the training data, data set is small. So in basically for that, we set K to be the number of data points. If K is the number of data points, then it becomes leave one out cross validation because in every fold, you are leaving one of the data points for the test. Okay? Then you the, the rest is as before. Cheating number one in machine learning. The test sets and training sets should be disjointed. Otherwise, you are doing cheating. I should emphasize on this slide in this course especially. In regular statistical machine learning, people don't make this mistake usually because they usually divide their data into training and test and validation. In deep learning, have you seen what people do? Many of the papers are doing cheating, actually. I myself have rejected some papers when I, were reviewer, when I was a reviewer, saying that you should do all of your experiments again because you have done cheating. How do they do cheating? You know? Now, they usually say that, I will tell you, so for we'll see in a few slides that for tuning hyperparameters, you have to use validation. You shouldn't use either training or test. I will tell you why, okay? But you, in deep learning, whenever you read a paper and they said they have to split their data to train and test, it means that they have done cheating. How do they, did they know their batch size? How do they know their learning rate? How did they, so do you know what they have done? For example, they say, okay, I have four layers. Its accuracy became 80%. Let me add another layer. Its accuracy became 85, so five layers is better. But what was that accuracy? It was test data. But you are not supposed to have access to the test data. Of course, if you tune your parameters to get the best result, you, you are cheating, right? Let me tell you this with some example. Assume you want to train you, you are in industry and you want to train some model to put on the, uh, on the intersections for traffic, okay? You get some project from uh, the ministry. What do you do? You, tr you have some data, you train your model, etc. Whatever you do, try your best. Then you sell it to the ministry. What does the ministry do? They put it, they install it. In, on the intersection, on the light of the intersection, then they turn it on, see what happens. What happens there, that's the test data. That's the actual test data. In the industry, you're not supposed to have test data while training. Now assume I have tuned my hyperparameters 
using training data or using test data, sir, using my, my own test data. So I have some data set. I split to train and test. Then I get 80% I, of test accuracy. I tune my hyperparameters such as number of layers, et cetera. It becomes 90%. My manager is very happy. They go to the ministry says, we got 90% accuracy. They will also get very happy, right? It's not, they put it on the intersection. We have a lot of accidents. Why? Because the accuracy there becomes 40%. Because I just cheated. Of course, with cheating, it becomes 90%. This happens a lot in deep learning, especially. Why? Can you tell me why this happens a lot in deep learning? Because in deep learning, usually people don't do cross-validation. And what is the reason for that? In cross-validation, in every fold of cross-validation, what happens? Usually people train. We, in every fold of cross-validation, we train again. Do you remember? We train our model again. But we know that training in deep learning takes a lot of time. What if our training takes three days? Then I do 10 fourth class validation. I should, it takes one month of training, right? So they don't do cross validation. As a result, they don't care about tuning that much. They tune it by chance. I'm saying that oh, that's okay if you tune it by chance, but tune it on the validation. Did you get it? Tune it by chance. Move it, move the learning rate a little bit, change the number of layers, but see the accuracy on the validation data and at the end, see what happens to the test. Don't tune it by the test accuracy. People do that a lot in deep learning especially, okay? That's cheating number one. We have another cheating too. So yeah, so we separate, usually separate our data to train, validation and test where train is usually larger than validation and test, okay? Then we tune our uh, parameters on, on the validation set. By the way, how do we use validation in the cross-validation? Because the cross-validation, for example, I, that I explained to 10-fold cross-validation was using train and test, right? So basically what we can do is simple. Assume in this k-fold cross-validation, this is my, our test, right? Add another line here where you split your T to train, to actual train and validation. Basically in every fold, split your data into train, validation and test, right? You can do it in hierarchical way. What do I mean? Split it into the two sets. One of the, the sets will be test, then split the other set to train and validation again, okay? We usually do it in Python in a hierarchical way. Why? Because the scikit-learn function only splits into two parts. Okay, that's the reason. Anyway, did you get it? Did you get it? So basically, what do I mean? Assume I have, I wanna do cross-validation, which is not used often in deep learning, but let me tell you briefly. I have, for example, two parameters, hyperparameters. Then I do, I know that my first hyperparameter can take some values. For example, I say my first hyperparameter H1, some values for that. Then another for loop for H2, some values. So basically I calculate, I have this with this value. So I have pairs of the hyperparameters, right? Then I have the for loop for the K fold. Then here I have the error of K. Do you see it becomes a nested loop for cross-validation when I have hyperparameters? Do you see what I'm doing here? For every pair of, or every combination of my hyperparameters, I can do a cross-validation. Okay? This cheating, take it seriously. I myself, in some of my initial papers, had cheated but I didn't know at that time, okay? And they got published, but they, they have cheated. They have cheated in them, okay? I didn't know at that time, okay? Cheating number two in machine learning. So let me tell you that when we have training, validation and test, they should be, all of them should be disjointed. And their union usually becomes the whole data, okay? So cheating number two is when the validation and test 
uh, is are are not combined. I think it, I explained cheating number one as cheating number two. Doesn't matter. So we have two types of cheating. Doesn't matter which one is one and two. So one of them, as I said, you shouldn't use the test data for tuning your Harpy prime. So you should use validation. That's one thing. Another cheating that I was saying here was that training and test should be disjointed. Yes. Did you, do you understand the slight difference between these two types of cheating? In one of the cheatings, it doesn't matter number one, number two. Let me understand the idea behind it. In one of the cheatings, I'm using test for training. Okay. I'm not supposed to have access to the test data. In another cheating, I'm using tests for tuning the hyperparameters. You, so in one of the cheatings, I'm using tests for training. In other cheatings, I'm using tests for tuning hyperparameters. Both are wrong. Okay? Both are wrong. And so as a result, all of them should be disjointed. Have I explained? Okay. Can I tell you, can, I, can you tell me that if I use test for tuning hyperparameters, what is it? It's cheating, right? What if I use training for hyper tra tuning hyperparameters? What is that? So there are three cases that might happen. I use test for tuning hyperparameters. I use validation for tuning hyperparameters. I use train in data for hy training hyperparameters, right? I have three sets, right? Let's talk about them one by one. Using Validation for tuning hyperparameters. That's the correct thing. That's the correct thing. Now the other two. Using test for tuning hyperparameters. That's cheating. I'm not supposed to have access to the test data. Using training for the training data for the tuning hyperparameters. What is it? What, what, what? Weaken, Weaken the model. Exactly. Exactly. That's the reason it's bad for us. In other words, when you do cheat, it's good for you, right? You benefit from it. It's the, but when you use training for tuning, it's bad for you. You're harming yourself. Why? Because you never find out overfitting. You never, if it overfits, you will not find out. Okay? That's the reason. So, we talked about it. Okay. Justification of overfitting. Now, do you remember? So here, consider this estimation error versus co model complexity, okay? The model complexity, do you remember in overfitting, we said that the more complexity it becomes, the more overfitting I have, right? As a result, this part is overfitting. The more I go in this axis, it overfits more. Right now, go the other way around. It becomes underfitting. Right, we know that in overfitting we have low bar bias but high variance. We talked about it. In underfitting we have high bias and low variance. Agreed. Right, and in the middle case scenario, it's good fit. Now let's understand what happens. By the way, rather than this axis model complexity, sometimes we use iteration. Why? or time, whatever. Why? When my algorithm, some algorithms, some machine learning algorithms are in one shot, right? They are not iterating. Then we use only model complexity because you can co co complicate, uh, make your model complicated, right? Complex. But what if my algorithm is iterated? Can I use iteration index rather than model complexity? Yes, why? Because the more I train in the iterations, the more complex my model becomes. Agree? That's fine. So here might we say iterate. And in deep learning, it's iterative. Right? It's iterative. Now, as a result in deep learning, you can see it as error versus iteration or epochs, whatever you call it. Okay? Now, the training error is going down, 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 down. It might have some oscillations because it's not, it's not necessarily convex, right? It might have, but the overall pattern is usually decreasing, the overall pattern. If you do a moving average, 
and that is usually decreased. Okay. The training error always reduces. Why? It might stagnate at the end, but it usually re always reduces because you're getting, you're minimizing the training error. You're minimizing that. It's going down. But va validation error initially also starts decreasing. But at some point, it just starts decreasing again. Why? Don't accept anything without result, without reason. Why does the validation error go up? You remember that? The, or the true error? Recall that formula. Where was that? Let me find it. This formula. This is validation error, right? Or true error. This is training error. Agree? Agree? What is that? The complexity. If you, let's plot for them one by one. Plot true error. I told you that it's always decreased, right? With some oscillations maybe. Now let's plot this term. What is that? Complexity. If you plot it, how is it increasing or decreasing? Increasing because this is the axis of complexity, right? Right? It goes up. What is this? Consider this formula. Validation error equals tr training error with some plus some constant, I don't care, plus complexity. Basically, I'm adding these two plots. Complexity and the training error. If you add these two up, what happens? In, in this part, what happens? This is a small, this is large. This becomes large. In this case, this is a small, this is large. So in this case, it's the other way around. Tra training error is a small, complexity is large. Therefore, this is also large. In this case, both are small. It becomes a small. So it becomes like a bone. This is the reason that this goes like this. Because of this, now you see the beauty of what Professor Alivosi did, right? He explained why validation error goes up like this according to this short lemma, Stein's lemma. Did you understand it? Right? That's very cool. That's very cool. Okay. That was the beauty that I was talking about. That was it. So we talked about this. Here in a nutshell, training and tests shouldn't be shouldn't be uh, contaminated, otherwise cheating number one. And if we have all of them, so training and test, cheating number one, validation and test, cheating number two. If training and validation have some contamination, it's harmful to us, right? We'll not find out overfitting. Why? Do you know why? If you use training as validation, the training error always goes down, never comes up, right? You will not find out when it is going up again. Re regularization. So, let me finish this slide deck and then we'll have break. So what do we want to do in machine learning? Is the empirical error important to me or true error? True error. So I should minimize the true error, right? So let's minimize the true error and, and should, which true error should we use? Which formula for true error? The true error for the training data because I'm using training data for optimization, right? Right? So I'm, as a result, I'm minimizing the true error, which is this. It, we found this formula, right? What is this? What is this? Can I, can I analyze it? This is the empirical error that I can measure. What is the empirical error? The error between predicted labels and the labels in the data set. What is this? The complexity. 
the overfitting. Can I see it as a regularization term? As a penalty term, right? So basically when I'm minimizing these, this is constant, I don't care, okay? When I'm minimizing this plus this, you know that when you minimize F plus G, you are minimizing both F and G, right? A linear combination of them. So basically what am I doing? Minimizing the empirical error that I have in hand. Also at the same time, minimizing the overfitting. I don't want to overfit. I'm minimizing the complexity. And you know that it's a trade-off because when you minimize the empirical error too much, the complexity goes up. So it's a trade-off. It says minimize the empirical error at the same time, minimize the complexity. Very good. Right? So have the best of two worlds, kind of. So as a result, rather than minimizing J, which is the empirical error, regularize it by some penalty on the complexity. I denote it by omega x. x is the optimization variable, right? And alpha is a weight. How much should I care about the penalty compared to the actual cost, right? We call this a weight regularization term, regularization parameter or regularization parameter, sorry. We call this regularization term, we call alpha regularization parameter, it's a hyperparameter. We call omega penalty or regularization, whatever we call it, regularization term. So it's a penalty on complexity, right? Now we relax this. We say rather than using this derivative, which might be complex, use simple penalty. But this penalty should be on the complexity, right? Now you understand why you, you see a lot of regular regularized optimization problems in machine learning including deep learning. We see that a lot, regularized last functions. This is the reason. Interesting. By the way, J tilde is the regularized objective function. So this is what we had. And we can also explain it by betting on the sparsity principle or Occam's razor. So basically, when we say don't become too much complex, you can see sometimes if we use, for example, L1 norm, we can use, by the way, different norms for this penalty term, right? L2 norm, L1 norm. If it is matrix Frobenius norm, we have talked about all of these in preliminaries, right? When it is L1 norm, it becomes a sparse. We'll, we'll see that. We'll see that in a few slides. And it was good because of betting on a sparsity principle. What is that? It's a principle in machine learning proposed by Chip Shirani and Hasty at Stanford University in the book, Statistical, the machine, Statistical Learning, Elements of a Statistical Learning, okay, published by Springer. So do, what do they do? What do they say? They say, blindfold me, give me an algorithm which is dense, and also the sparse version of the same algorithm. Then run them on some data. Without looking, I bet that the sparse algorithm works better. Okay? That's one thing. Occam's razor says that Occam was a logician and philosopher. Ancient. Okay. He said, if two things explain the same phenomenon, the simpler explanation is the better one. A, a good example of that, I'm hungry. Two examples, two explanations. Either I, I haven't eaten for hours. The second explanation, some alien came, which was invisible and made me hungry sorry, suddenly. Both explain why I'm hungry, but which one is valid? Okay. So Occam's razor is that. According to these, we can say that the less complex, the better. As a result, regularization helps avoid overfitting, right? Because that's a penalty on overfit. Now let's talk about L2 norm regularization and L1 norm regularization. We see that a lot in deep learning as well. The L2 norm regularization, so the penalty is this, a squared L2 norm. And I put two here. Sometimes we put two 
because we know that the derivative of a squared L2 norm becomes 2x. So we get rid of that too. Here, notice that it's a squared L2 norm. Why? Why is it a square? Why should it be a squared L2 norm? Recall preliminaries. <laughs> what did we say? Squared L2 norm is a quadratic form, right? It's convex. Is L2 norm convex? It's not. L2 norm is not convex. And we don't want to add something which is not convex to our last function to make it more complicated, right? <clears throat> this is also called Reed regression or Tikhonov regularization. Tikhonov was a Russian mathematician. So suppose X star, now let's analyze it theoretically. Suppose X star is the minimizer of J, the actual cost, okay? According to the first order optimality condition or what we learned in high school, the derivative at the minimum is zero, right? So derivative of J at X star is zero. Theta is the parameters, by the way, some, some parameters of the uh, cost maybe. Now consider the Taylor series expansion of J. So J hat is a Taylor series expansion of J up to two second derivative. It becomes this, where H is the Hessian at the point X star, okay? As a result, this term becomes zero according to equation 25. It, it becomes simplified to this. Let me go faster on that. So then, then I replace J with J hat, which we found. We'll get this in this equation, okay? Then what happens? I, I wanna minimize J tilde, right? I want to minimize J tilde. What should I do? It's an unconstrained optimization problem. What did we learn in high school? Take derivative, set it to zero. Take derivative with respect to X, set it to zero. If you re rearrange the terms, it becomes this. Again, this part is a pain in the neck. Multiply, left multiply the size by its inverse. It becomes this, right? Okay. Does it make sense? Does it make sense? Set alpha to zero, what happens? If alpha is zero, basically it means that I don't have any regularization, right? Then what happens? X dagger, which is the solution, of which is the minimizer of J tilde, becomes H inverse H X star. What is H inverse H? Identity. So X dagger becomes X star as a, that's true because J tilde becomes J when alpha is zero. Now apply the eigenvalue decomposition of the Hessian. So if I replace H with its eigenvalue decomposition, U delta U uh, transpose, then, that, then I simplify. So I don't explain the simplification. I have explained it. I suppose that you have watched the videos, then you will get this, okay? But let's analyze it. The analysis I think is more important. Again, if you set alpha to zero, you'll see it makes sense. So here, consider this, that we found. This is a relation between what? X dagger and X star. X star is the minimizer of the actual cost, J. X dagger is the minimizer of regularized cost, J tilde. Let's see what happens. So we have, I think we have these term. Consider this term in between. Let's analyze it. Here it is, right? Lambda is a diagonal matrix. Why? What was lambda? You remember? Let's go back. You don't memorize anything, right? What is that? Equation 28. Lambda is... Equation 28 is the eigenvalue decomposition of Hessian. So what is lambda? What is U? The eigenvectors of Hessian. What is lambda? Eigenvalues, right? And we know that it's a diagonal matrix, right? Like uh, eigen, having the eigenvalues on the diagonal. Agreed? 
Lambda is diagonal. I, identity matrix is diagonal. H, lambda plus alpha I is diagonal there. What is the, according to linear algebra, what is the inverse of a diagonal matrix? Do you remember? It's very interesting. The inverse of a diagonal matrix is still a diagonal matrix where the elements are reciprocal of the elements of the, okay? As a result, this is also diagonal. Lambda was diagonal. Multiplication of two diagonal elements becomes diagonal. So the whole thing is diagonal. Okay. Now let's see what is this. So I have lambda one over lambda one plus alpha y. Can you tell me? This is exactly here. Write it in element wise. It becomes lambda over lambda plus alpha, right? Now let's see what is lambda over lambda plus alpha. Let's consider, play around with the value of alpha. So, or compare the value of lambda and alpha. Consider lambda j, lambda j. The j direction, one of them, right? Lambda goes from lambda one to lambda v. Bear with me, it's become interesting. There we go. So lambda j, okay? Then, can you tell me if lambda j is much greater than alpha? Let's recall our knowledge from limit in high school, maybe initial years of undergrad. Uh, limit lambda j over lambda j plus alpha, where lambda j is much greater than alpha. Becomes one, right? Becomes one. Then what does it mean? So that direction, for example, becomes one. The other case limits that fraction where lambda j is much less than alpha. In other words, limit alpha goes alpha goes to all infinity, for example. What happens? Lambda j over lambda j plus alpha becomes zero. Right? Right? So maybe one of them becomes zero. So one direction might become almost zero. In this case, one might direction becomes almost one. So it's a range between zero and one. Some of them become two small zero. Some of them become two small one. Agree? Agree? What does it mean? When it is one, what does it mean? That direction is important. Is important, okay? So I'm, uh, I'm keeping it. Why is it important? Because lambda j is much greater than alpha. What was lambda j? The eigenvalue of the Hessian. That direction is important with respect to alpha. Compared to the penalty, that direction is important in the objective function. Compared to the penalty. The other case, it says that penalty is more important. That direction of the objective is not that much important compared to the penalty, to the alpha. Alpha was a regularization parameter, right? So basically, in simple words, it says if, that, if one direction is important, keep it. If one direction is not important compared to the penalty, shrink it to close to zero. I don't care about that direction. Interesting, right? As a result, they also call it effective number of parameters or degrees of freedom. They call this summation of lambda j over lambda j plus alpha over j, right? They call it degrees of freedom. By the way, you can read about this also in the book Elements of Statistical Learning by Hasty and Tipshirani. Okay? Now it becomes more interesting. It becomes more interesting. So L1 non-regularization. I know you're tired, but give me five more minutes. Five or ten. Then, because we are in the middle of blooming, we don't want to... Okay. What? No, no, I, I will finish it. Then after the break, we'll start the regularization for deep learning. Okay. <laughs> okay. Just give me some time. I will finish it soon. So now assume I want to make my data, my optimization variable sparse. What does the sparse mean? A sparse forest means that I don't, it is zero, right? I don't have any trees. But then, if it is dense, I, have, I, have, I might have a lot of small trees and also large trees. 
But the sparseness, there is no tree of this, right? So there are zero, there are a lot of zeros. There is something named L0 norm with double coat. Why do we use double coat? Because it's not a norm. It doesn't satisfy the properties of the norm, okay? It's called subset selection. What does it do? Basically, it counts the number of non-zero elements. So when I use it as a penalty, what does it mean? Make it a sparse. I want to have a lot of zeros, right? But it's not norm, it's not convex, it's a pain in the neck, right? So, and we know that counting is discrete. It becomes discrete optimization. Or whenever you hear discrete optimization, be scared, okay? So we need to relax it. The, the best relaxation for L0 norm is L1 norm. L1 norm is actually a norm, okay? And uh, when we have penalty of L1 norm, we call it lasso. It was named by Tip Shirani. Lasso is short for least absolute shrinkage and selection operator. Tip Shirani named it, okay? So what does it do? Again, consider the Hessian and this time, by the way, I have L1 norm optimization. I can use various non-smooth opt. You know, L1 norm is not a smooth, right? At origin, agree? So I should use techniques for non-smooth optimization. For more information, see my optimization techniques course on YouTube, lecture non-smooth optimization. We have talked about it uh, a lot there. But there are some techniques such as soft thresholding, coordinate descent. Here we are going to use coordinate descent. Coordinate descent says that optimize the objective function with respect to the coordinates one by one. Its idea is similar to Gibbs sampling, if you know what Gibbs sampling is. Okay. So basically, rather than that, so I'm considering the jth coordinate, jth dimension of the objective function, and also I'm considering the Hessian. And here, this becomes a scalar, not vector anymore, right? And I know that this L1 norm becomes absolute value, right? For one of the directions. Then what should we do? Take derivative, set it to zero, as in high school. Always go back to high school, right? Take derivative, set it to zero. When we see that, calculate it, it becomes what? Let's, let's draw it. It becomes like this. The plot of this formula is this. Plot x, j uh, dagger with respect to x, j star. It becomes this, okay? If you plot it, I don't want to analyze the plot for you. You might, you are, you are tired. But if you plot this, it becomes this. Can you tell me, this plot is very famous in L1 normal optimization. It's called soft thresholding. Okay, soft threshold. Usually, whatever method you start with for solving L1 norm optimization, you will end up with soft threshold interest. Okay, so what is it saying? Now let's analyze it. Xj dagger with respect to Xj star. Xj star is the optimizer of the objective function without regularization. Xj dagger is a op minimizer of regularized objective function with L1 norm regularized, right? So basically it says that if Xj star is large, it's absolute value, shrink it, so make it a smaller, shrink it, right? But if it is too small in some range, make it zero. As a result, it becomes a sparse. Many of them are pushed to be exactly zero, right? It becomes a sparse. Interest. Let's visualize it. Let's visualize it. Guys, this is very important. It's very interesting. Do you remember minimize f of x plus lambda omega x with respect to x and we know that omega x is, is a, considered L1 norm. For example, omega x here in this case, omega x is L2 norm. What do I mean? It's squared L2 norm. Here, omega x is L1 norm. Okay. 
When I say minimize f of x, consider only, only minimization of f of x. Ignore omega x. Then my f of x, for example, assume my f of x is like a bowl coming up. Its minimum is here. So you see it's coming up, a bowl coming up. Its minimum is here. So x1 star and x2 star as this. Here I'm assuming that my dimensionality is two. Okay? So x1 star, x2 star. So far clear? I'm going step by step. Now consider only minimization of omega x. Omega x. Then what happens? The unit norm of, so it becomes norm, right? Minimize the norm. The unit norm, unit ball of the norm, L2 norm is like this. Unit ball of L1 norm is like di diamond. For more information, see my pre the preliminaries in my optimization course, okay? Doesn't matter. So basically on this ball, in, in this ball, uh, my norm is less than or equal to one, okay? So when I'm minimizing that, can you tell me what happens to minimization of only omega x? What is that? The solution of minimized omega x, which is solution of minimized a squared L2 norm of x is what? Minimize a squared L2 norm of x, only this. It's zero, right? Origin. You don't agree? You don't agree? Minimize, guys, what is that? Either imagine it or solve it. If you solve it, take derivative. What does it become? It becomes two x equals, set it to zero. Solution is zero. Or imagine it, it's like a bowl originated in origin. It's like, all right? So, or minimize L1 norm x. That's also zero. So basically, if I only minimize f of x, my solution are these here. If I only minimize the penalty, my solution is here. Can you tell me what is the minimization of the linear combination? It might be, it might be, it must be somewhere in between. Somewhere in between. Now, how do we find somewhere in between? So I have some cost, I have another cost. Let's see where they, cut each other, intersect each other. This is exactly what we do. Here, we make the bowl bigger and bigger. Here also, we are becoming bigger and bigger. So two bowls, two bowls. Where do they cut? Intersect here maybe, right? Then this becomes X1 dagger and X2 dagger. As, as expected, X1 dagger and X2 dagger are smaller than X1 star and X2 star because they are penalized. They are shrinked. Right? But what about L1 norm? Unit ball of L1 norm is like a bowl, but how can I design it for you? Uh, can you imagine it? It's like a bowl like this. Bowl with uh, straight edges. Can you imagine what I'm saying? A diamond which is going up like this, okay? So it's going up like this. Also we have the bowl of the f of x. Where do they cut each other? They usually cut at the corner of the bowl of the diagonal of the diamond, right? Then x1 dagger and x2 dagger becomes here. Here, interestingly, x1 dagger becomes zero. Here, x1 dagger was a small, but here in figure b, x1 dagger becomes exactly zero. Do you see the difference? L1 norm pushes a lot of coordinates to zero. L1, L2 norm shrinks it, but doesn't make it zero necessarily. So that's the difference. L1 norm is a sparse, right? Now this is in 2D. Can you imagine if I increase the dimensionality, this diamond becomes a lot, will have a lot of sharp edges. The probability that this bowl f of x cuts the uh, edges be becomes higher and higher when the dimensionality increases. And when it touches one of the corners, a lot of elements, a lot of di directions become zero. That's the reason L1 norm is very effective for making it a sparse. You see that? You need to imagine. You need to imagine. 
this, the credit of this imagination and this figure is for Tipshirani. In the same paper he, that he proposed L1 norm regular regularization. And these are acknowledgements. So you can see the textbook of Hasty and Tipshirani elements of a statistical learning. Another textbook that they wrote about sparse machine learning is this Tipshirani Hasty et al. Statistical learning with sparsity, the lasso and generalizations. Some slides are inspired by teachings of Professor Ali Gotsi at the University of Waterloo. Some slides are inspired by lectures of Professor Hoda Muhammad Zadat at Sharif University of Technology. And some slides are based on our tutorial paper, the theory behind overfitting, cross validation, regularization, bagging, and boosting tutorial. And these are the references. Any questions? No? Okay, let's have a break and come back at nine and we will continue. Is this good? Okay, I will continue with the regularization and deep learning. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else there? Uh, Shall we start? Did you have enough rest? Okay, great. So now uh, let's talk about regularization in deep learning. So, so far we talked about regularization in general, now in deep learning. So as I said, yeah, here I'm saying that we are assuming that we, we already studied the previous, uh, the regularization for machine learning. Now let's talk about regularization techniques for deep learning. One of them is weight decay. Okay. So recall the L2 norm regularization from the lecture of overfitting. Do you remember that? Right. So what is our optimization parameter in deep learning? Can you tell me? Weights. Thank you. So W, so it's a weight. Now, rather than X, I have W, right? So here, then in weight decay, assume I have some actual loss, such as mean squared error, cross entropy, et cetera, plus some regularization term, squared L2 norm of W, okay? Agree? So what is it saying bef bef before continuing? Can you tell me? Me that what is this doing? Minimize J plus a squared L2 norm of W. Assume my W becomes 1 million, one of the values of the W, one of the weights becomes 1 million, but it minimizes J a lot. Right? If I say minimize J only, maybe that W becomes, that weight becomes 1 million. Is it good? No, I don't want my weights to explode in terms of length, right? So I penalize the length of my weights. I shouldn't, I don't want them to become too much in terms of value, length, absolute value, right? One million, one minus one million, both are bad. Agreed? Because if it becomes one million, the penalty term will explode. Agreed so far? Okay. This is called weight decay because we're decaying the weights, okay? Uh, and as you see, it's an L2 norm regularization, right? What if I want in my weight decay, I want, I, they usually use a squared L2 norm. What if I want my weights to be sparse? What should I do? L1 norm, I put L1 norm. And uh, by the way, I think similar to this question uh, where, that it was a simple neural network with simple W matrices was asked in an interview of Google. So I'm saying that what you're learning might be useful for you when you're interviewing, having interviews with big companies, okay? So be careful about that. And uh, according to nonlinear activation functions that we know that uh, we might have very large weights or very nonlinear parts of activation function. Do you agree that? What is, this is sigmoid, do you remember? Or this is 
hyperbolic tangent. Agreed? What? When I'm here, this is almost linear. Activation function is almost linear. Agreed? My uh, values are small. But when I'm here or here, my values are large and I'm too nonlinear. So in too much nonlinear parts of the activation function, the values become too big, right? In this case, then the weight decay plays a role, not to bring us to the very nonlinear parts of the activation function. Can you tell me what it is saying actually? So it prevents us to go to too much nonlinear parts of the activation function. What does it mean? So basically it wants us to remain in the almost linear parts of the activation function. Do you agree that these parts are almost linear? Almost linear, I'm saying. Agree? So it's a trade-off. Okay. When I'm having nonlinear complex data, the data pushes me toward nonlinear parts of the activation function to handle nonlinearity of data. But the penalty of weight decay says not so much. Don't become too much nonlinear, become a bit linear. So it's a trade off between being nonlinear and linear. Do you see that? You see that? Okay. This is penalty. Always penalty term is a trade off. Trade off. Don't, not so much. Don't go too much fat, too much far. So do remember we ended up with this formula for L2 norm regularization, right? Now, rather than X puts W. Okay, now let's see what happens. Again, the same analysis. We talked about this analysis, the shrinkage, right? Applies here, the same analysis. Okay, so weight decay is over. We just talked about weight decay. Now, <laughs> let's talk about noise injection to input in neural networks. Noise injection to inputs in neural networks. What does it mean? Sometimes we can add noise to the input data itself. One way to see that is what? Augmenting data. Have you heard of data augmentation? So what is data augmentation? So I have some data. I want to train my neural network. Do you agree that if I don't have too, much, too many data, I will face a problem because my network is complex. I need to have enough data to train it, right? So one way to add to data is to generate data out of my own data. That's called data augmentation. Let's augment to the data. There are techniques, various techniques, image processing techniques, for example, or signal processing techniques for data augmentation, such as, for example, your data is image. You can do what to generate new data? You have some image. You want to make another image out of it. What do you do? Revert, flip, you mean, right? Flipping in that X direction, Y direction, or both. Rotating, translating. These are the ways that you can make, right? Cropping and these, these things. There are various ways to do data augmentation. One of the techniques is adding noise. You have some data, add noise to it, right? So you can see that data augmentation. Also, by the way, you know that when you, you are doing rot rotation or translation for data augmentation, what does it do? It makes our network robust to rotation and translation. Because I, I say, hey, network, this is Benjamin. This is also Benjamin. Right? I agree. <clears throat> if we do not introduce enough, well, where were we? Okay. They have a huge number of weights uh, parameters. So data augmentation is useful when we have huge number of parameters, but we don't have enough data. Another way to inter interpret that is regularization. So can you believe that we can explain noise injection to data to input by regularization? So some of these regularization techniques are not obvious to be equivalent to that penalty term. But interestingly, you can write all of them as that regularization term. And we, are, we see that, we see that. Weight decay was directly in that form. Now let's see what noise injection to input. 
So do you agree that uh, my, I want to assume my neural network wants to do that. What is this? It's mean a squared error, right? Between the predicted label and the actual labels in the data set, right? So do you agree now? Rather than X, so Y hat of X, what does it mean? The predicted label for input X. Rather than X, I put X plus epsilon, epsilon, which is noise. So I add a noise because I usually have additive noise. We can have multiplicative noise too, but usually here we mean additive noise. We add noise to that, okay? So if we do that, do you remember in, in calculus and math one or calculus one we have to, we can write it as taylor series no no, no. sorry sorry <laughs> i apologize that's the next step so here here i use a binomial theorem a plus b squared is a squared plus b squared plus 2ab so i write it as this 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 right then we know expectation is linear operator so I have expectations. Agreed? Okay, now here I have y hat of x plus epsilon. I write it as Taylor series expansion. I can write it. So I write it as this, this, this. And this is the, the other terms that I ignore. I go to the second derivative, second order derivative only. Now this is what, these are what we had in the previous slide. I'm repeating them. Okay, now uh, I'm gonna put this Taylor series expansion instead of y hat x plus epsilon in this j tilde, okay? Then what happens? Can you tell me? Basically, if I do that, I will get these two lines. So far clear, right? Now, this part is a bit tricky. I remember last semester I was on this for 20 minutes, <laughs> for uh, 15 minutes. But this time I will be faster. So let me tell you, I'm seeing my notations in the previous semester, so I can write it here. Uh, this part is why, do you agree I use the binomial theorem? Uh, so I use y hat x squared plus epsilon transpose derivative of y hat x squared plus 2. By the way, here, I almost say this is 0. Why? Can you tell me? We know that when it is a small value, a small function is a small derivative becomes a smaller, second order derivative becomes a smaller. Second order derivative to the power of two becomes too much a smaller, almost zero, ignore it, okay? So these two, then I will have two y hat epsilon transpose derivative of y hat x. So far clear? Now, okay, uh, let me see. This term, I write it as one, where is it? It's here. It's here, okay? Then, let me see. I write this as two. Where is this two? Um, it's here, okay? Then, I write this as three. Where is this three? It's here, okay? Then, I write this as four. Where is this? It's here. I write this part as five. Where is this five? It's here. And I remember that approximately I, uh, I said, give me a second for the seventh one for this one. Let me remember what, what where it was.
Why? Give me a second. Yeah, this one which we ignored, if you consider it back again, although you can also say that this is almost zero, okay? But if you consider it back again, you have this term in the binomial theorem, you also have this term. So you know that one of them becomes 2AB, right? 2 this times this becomes this. Okay. I agree this is a bit complicated, but this is how it is. <laughs> okay. I just explained to you how we simplified these two lines to this. Okay. So now let's go further. Let's go further. The noise epsilon is a normal distribution zero and sigma squared i. Okay. So I'm assuming the noise has mean zero and the variance sigma squared in all dimensions. So it's isom isomorphic, is is isometric. I don't know what we call it. It's like a hypersphere noise. Then as a result, expectation of epsilon transpose epsilon becomes sigma squared according to the formula for variance. Do you remember? Recall preliminaries because its mean is also zero. Then can you tell me what happens to this? Uh, this term. This term. These two are independent of each other. Do you agree? This is noise. This is why derivative of y hat. They are independent of each other. As a result, I can write it as expectation of epsilon transpose squared times expectation of this squared. We know that epsilon transpose squared, you can write it as epsilon transpose epsilon, right? In the vector form. This form, this is a squared, uh, this is a vector squared. So you can see it as L to norm squared, okay? We know that this part is sigma squared and the rest is as before, okay? Where were we? The rest of the expression is simplified as this. Let's see what, what do I mean by the rest of the explanation. I'm going back and forth between. Okay, this term, term four is here. This is term four. What is this one? Term star is here. Term star. Okay. Let me go back. Term star is here. Term four is here. Okay. These two also get simplified. How? These two twos cancel each other. Agreed? And we know that again, epsilon is independent of these two. So I can write it as this times this. Also, epsilon transpose, I have it here. Epsilon transpose epsilon. They are independent of the rest. So they like, come out. I also have the rest as here, right? Then I know that these two are sigma squared according to the previous slide, and I factor it out, right? Okay. You need to bear with me a bit. I know it's a bit math heavy, but we have to cover it, okay? And then what happens as a result? By the way, let's talk about now one. So we talked about five here. We talked about four and a star here. Now re it remains one, two, and three here. Agreed? What is one, two, three? According to binomial theorem, the other way around. It becomes expectation of y hat minus y squared. So it becomes mean a squared error. Okay? Okay? If we put all of this together, it becomes this. Simplified this. Okay? So far clear? What is this? It's very interesting. What is this? Regularized optimization problem with L2 norm penalty. This is L2 norm squared L2 norm penalty. Do you see that? Can you tell me what this is saying? 
derivative of y hat x with respect to x. What does it mean? The penalty term. What is the definition of derivative in high school? Tweak the input, see how much it changes the output, right? A, a derivative of y hat x is the prediction of network for x with respect to x. So basically, what does it mean? Tweak the input, see how much the predicted output changes. That's the measure of complexity also, right? We just saw that by adding noise to the input, it's equivalent to have a penalty term on the complexity of how much the output changes with respect to input. Did you get it? So basically it says that when you are adding noise to, I think it makes sense intuitively as well. When you add noise to input, what happens? You're telling the network, if I change my input, do not change drastically. Tolerate it, tolerate noise. That's exactly what it is saying, right? You're penalizing that penalty term. Interesting. So also equivalently, we can have, we can inject noise to the weights of the neural network. That can be equivalently analyzed. System. So we can either add noise to the input of the neural network or to the weights of the neural network. Okay, that's noise injection to the weights. Okay, these two, these are over. So we talked about weights decay. We talked about noise injection to the input or noise injection to the weights of the neural network. Now early stopping in neural networks. Do you remember these, these plots? I'm not gonna repeat them, right? Do you remember this, right? So we had overfitting, underfitting, and we said why this happens, when, why the validation error goes up because of the summation of these two plots. Do you remember? Now, let's analyze early stopping. What is early stopping, by the way? What is the definition of early stopping before analyzing it? It means that its name is exactly its name, early stop, stop early. So what does it mean? It means that start training, you start training, okay? So you are going, the number of iterations, this is the axis of iterations as well, right? Iteration or epochs. Go, go, go and measure at, the, at each epoch, measure the training error and the validation error. You know that a training error goes down with some oscillation, right? The validation error initially goes down with some oscillation. But when the validation, the pattern of validation error starts to go up, stop there. Don't train further. I think it's according to rationality because when you train further, the validation error goes up. Do you agree? Agree? Early stopping is one of the most used regularization techniques in deep learning. We use that a lot, okay? Do you see that? By the way, it, you can do it in two ways. You can uh, tell your network to stop or no, you can go, you can tell your network train until some maximum number of iterations, but save the validation error and the training error always. And then at the end, you go and see where the validation error has started. So you say that I want this epoch checkpoint, okay? Again, you are validating on the validation set, not the test set, okay? You shouldn't do early stopping on the test data. That's cheating, okay? So that's one thing. Again, I have seen a lot, especially in industry. <laughs> In industry, this is not a big deal because it's in industry, but in papers, if you do that, it's a key, it kills the paper. If, I have seen that a lot that paper do early stopping on the test stage. If you do that, that's cheating, okay? So, uh, so you know what it means, right? right? It said at every epoch, they calculate the accuracy of the test data and see which epoch has the best accuracy of the test. That's early stuff, that's cheating. So, okay, this is regular, uh, let's consider it, let's see how we can 
analyze early stopping as a regularization parameter, regularized optimization. Let's see. So consider this L2 norm regularization or Tikhonov regularization. Again, the same thing that we had. We know that derivative, the first order derivative at W star is zero when W star is the minimizer of J. Then again, we write its uh, Taylor series expansion. We know that this first order term goes away because of equation six. We, we talked about this a few minutes ago. And then the Hessian, the eigenvalue decomposition of the Hessian. When we, uh, uh, then, give me a second. Now, equation seven, consider this equation seven. The derivative of J hat, what was J hat? This was equation seven, the Taylor series expansion. The derivative of J hat, what happened? It becomes this, right? Do you agree or no? This is quadratic with respect to W. It becomes first order with respect to W in derivative, agree? So now what is this? Zero, right? We know that the according to first order optimality condition, the gradient vanishes at the minima, minimum. Or in other words, in high school, derivative is in the minimum is zero, right? It goes away, so it becomes this. Now, we know that back propagation is nothing but gradient descent and chain rule, right? So let's write the formula of gradient descent. Then, rather than derivative of j hat at wt, I write exactly what we found here. So far clear. Okay, interrupt me if you don't understand any part. Challenge me, please. Okay, please. So then what happens? I have WT minus one here, WT minus one here. Let's factor it out, right factor it out. So I will get this. I factor it out. Also, have minus W is subtract W star from the sides. So we'll get this. Okay, if you subtract W star from the sides and factor out the similar terms, you will get this. Okay. Then I replace H with its eigenvalue decomposition. Okay. I'll get this. Now Assume the initial weights are zero for, for the sake of analysis, for the sake of analysis. Then what happens? I consider let T to be one. Then W one minus W star becomes this, this term. W, w zero, I'm assuming it's zero. So zero minus W star. These uh, so this minus goes here, and then I will have W star. So far, clear. Okay. Then what am I doing here? I bring minus W star to the other side, and I factor out W star. So I'll get this. Okay. By the way, I is the identity matrix. Can I write I as U, U transpose? What was U? What was U? Eigenvectors of H. So U, U transpose is identity because U is an orthogonal matrix, right? So I can write I as U, U transpose, also this I as U, U transpose. Why am I doing that? Because I want to factor out U, U transpose. Because here I have U, U transpose. So if I do that, I left factor out U, right factor out U transpose. Can you tell me what this is doing? If I didn't have this term, what was it? It was U, U transpose W star, right? What is U transpose W star? You remember? Linear projection of that. What is U, U transpose W star? Recall preliminaries. No. U, no, assume it is truncated, for example, whatever. If it is not truncated, I agree. So, you said kind of correctly. So let me tell you again. U transpose W star is linear projection. U U transpose W star, U U transpose W star is reconstruction. 
if u is not truncated, then your u transpose is also one identity. So basically, if I don't have this in the middle, it means that rotate, if I don't truncate u, rotate uh, w star, rotate it back, right? But I have this case, this term in the middle. Okay, this term in the middle. So now by induction, by induction, so W, so this is the formula that we have. By induction, we have this. So because W1, we found its formula. If you solve it for W2, et cetera, you will see that for WT, I will have power T here, okay? T is an iteration index. Assuming that W0 is zero, right? Then multi left multiply the sides by U transpose. So I have U transpose, U transpose here. Agreed? So far clear? Then what happens? U transpose U is I identity because U is an orthogonal matrix. So it becomes this. Then do you remember recall equation two that we had for L2 norm regularization? We talked about it minutes ago before the break. Sorry. It's this, right? Left multiply the sides by U transpose. You will get this, right? By the way, W dagger is the solution to the regularized optimization. W star is the solution to actual cost without regularization term, okay? Then what am I doing here? I can write this as this. Why? See the book of good fellow. <laughs> Deep learning. Okay. Deep uh, good fellow has claimed this without any proof. So we trust him. <laughs> Apparently, this is equivalent to that. So we trust Yan good fellow. The, and Yoshua Bengio, the authors of the deep learning book. And we say that's it, okay? Now let's compare equations nine and 10. We derived equations nine and 10 with, with two different paths, okay? With two different derivations. And let's compare them. Equation 10 is for L2 norm regularization. Equation nine is for early stopping. Interestingly, they are very similar. They are very similar, right? Let's compare them. So I'm repeating equations nine and 10 together. Now the beauty appears, be careful. Here you will see the beauty. Comparing these two, if I want them to be equivalent, what happens? This should be equal to this, agreed? So I will have equation 11. Okay, now it blooms, you see. For some, eta, T, and alpha. T was the iteration index, alpha was the regularization parameter for the L2 norm, the penalty, right? What was eta? I, I myself forgot it. What was eta? Because we never memorized anything, right? What was eta? Do you remember? Can you help me? <laughs> the learning rate of gradient descent. Thank you, thank you. So here it, we had it, the learning rate of gradient descent. So now if we take logarithm from these expressions, take logarithm from the sides of equation 11, you will have logarithm of this. The logarithm of the left-hand side becomes this. T comes behind the logarithm, right? Now use Taylor series expansion of logarithm. It becomes this, okay? Okay, although it's math heavy, but it blooms the beauty, you'll see. Okay, then consider the right-hand side, it's logarithm. We know that logarithm of A, B is logarithm of A plus logarithm of B. Right. So I have this, and also minus one goes behind the logarithm plus logarithm of alpha. 
factor out alpha inside logarithm. Then, then again, logarithm of a, b equals logarithm of a plus logarithm of b. So I'll have this, this, and this. The last term is here, right? Agreed? Now, interestingly, these two cancel each other. Now I use, again, Taylor series expansion of logarithm. I'll get this. According to equation 11, equation 12 and 13 should be equal to each other. Agreed? Because when two things are equal to each other, their logarithms are also equal to each other. Logarithm is monotonic, right? So now assume equation 12 is equation equal to equation 13. If you compare them, alpha should be this, and t, in other words, t should be this. Alpha should be one over t, eta or t should be one over alpha eta. Let's see what it means. This is what we found. This shows that the inverse of the number of iterations, one over t, right? Is proportional to the weight decay L2 norm regularization parameter. Alpha was the L2 norm regularization parameter, right? Alpha is proportional to one over t. We just saw that. Can you see what it means? So basically, the more you t, you increase the iterations. What happens? Alpha goes down. So basically, you penalize less. Did you see the beauty? When you stop early, t is small. Alpha is larger. You are penalized. We could analyze early stopping as an L2 norm regularization. Very beautiful. Very beautiful, right? Credit is for, I think, good fellow in his book. Also, Professor Alicotzi has explained it very well. Okay. Drop out. For drop out, we need to explain bagging. Did I explain backing in this course? No. Okay, let me explain. So in, in statistical machine learning, I have explained it for random forest, but here for dropout, we need to know bagging again. So bagging is short for bootstrap aggregating. It's not related to bag, okay? It was first proposed by reference 15 in 1996. It's a meta-algorithm, what do I mean? It can be used with other algorithms, okay? Such as classifier regression. What is Buddhist for understanding bagging? We need to understand Buddhist strapping. Do you agree that I can do simple random sampling with replacement and without replacement, right? When you do simple random sampling without replacement, in a statistics, they call it Buddhist strapping, okay? So simple random sampling with replace, I said without will be, with replacement is bootstrapping. So when you sample, you put it back. You sample, put it back, right? It's called bootstrapping. But what is bootstrap aggregating or bootstrap bagging? What is that? You have your data, you bootstrap some sample, hence the name bootstrap aggregating, okay? You bootstrap some sample, you train a model with it. You replace the, the sample data back, shuffle them again, bootstrap another sample, train another model. You do it K times. So we have K model, agree? You have trained K models, now a test data point comes. You feed it to the trained models. You will have K predictions. What is the final prediction? We should somehow aggregate them, right? We can do, for example, if it is regression, we can do the mean. The average, average of prediction. Or we can pass it through a sign to be a classifier. And, or we can do majority votes, democracy, right? We can vote. So now let's analyze it theoretically. Theoretically. What is bagging doing? Let EJ denote the 
error of the jth model of the estimation for an instance, okay? J by the jth model. So we have K models, right? Jth model, it's error EJ, agreed, okay? EJ, I assume it's a Gaussian noise with mean zero and a standard deviation S or sigma square, okay? Then as a result, I think you know that expectation of EJ is zero, expectation of EJ squared is S, according to this formula that we had in preliminaries, right? Right? What is expectation of EJ, EL? Assume it's C. So C is the covariance of estimations of two trained models. So because every trained model has some variance of estimation, between I have I can have variance of estimation across two different models. Covariance, right? I denoted by C. As a result, expectation of EJ, EL, according to this formula, that we had in preliminaries, recall preliminaries, it becomes C, okay? Okay? Now let's see how we use them. Variance of F hat, what was F hat? Aggregated, Aggre so here, equation 15. Aggregated result, right? By the way, in, in statistics, they also call aggregation summary statistics so we do summary statistics of the results right so variance of f hat can what is it again according to the formulas in the preliminaries what is variance of some summations we had this formula do you remember first off one over k becomes one over k squared because variance has a square in it right right and k is not random, can come out of the variance. So it becomes one over k squared. Then I have variance of summation. According to the preliminaries, it is summation of variances plus summation of pairs of covariances. And I have one over k squared multiplied by both of them, right? Do you follow me? Yeah. <laughs> Then, what is variance of, what is this summation of variances? What is every variance? Variance of HJ? It's S. We talked about it, right? So I have K of them. KS. Right? What about this covariance? Can you tell me what is it? So each covariance is C. Each of them is C. Is C. How many do I have? How many cover pairs do I have? K times K minus one over two. Why? Because I'm in the second summation. I don't have, I don't calculate cover covariance is symmetric, right? I don't calculate covariance of A and B equals covariance of B and B and A here, right? So I, I only consider one of the triangles of in the cases. So K times K minus one over two, as a result, it becomes k times k minus one times c. Where did the two go? Let me remember. What happened to two? <laughs> no, oh, give me a second. Okay. Let me think. That's an important. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, okay, guys, guys. Here I'm, although covariance is symmetric, I'm calculating each covariance twice. So I'm saying that covariance of A and B plus covariance of B and A. Okay, I'm doing it. that. Therefore, it's two times. This, these two tools cancel each other. See the summation in the formula, okay? Suddenly I got scared <laughs> what happened. <laughs> okay. So I have these. Now let's simp this k cancels with one k. This k cancels with one k in the denominator. It becomes this. Okay. Now let's analyze it. Let's analyze it and you will see the beauty. You will see them. So this is what we found. 
Now assume two extreme cases. Either our models are very similar, the K models, or very, very different. Okay. What if they are very similar, co very correlated? Then the covariance becomes like variance. Covariance of two models becomes like variance of one model, right? Covariance of a model with another model, but that, and that other model is similar to this model. It's like variance of that model with itself, right? So C becomes almost S. Replace C with S. What happens? This summation becomes S. However, what if the models are very different, uncorrelated? Then C becomes zero, right? Zero. Because they are not related to each other. C becomes zero in the formula. Then the variance becomes one of K, S over K. What are equations 20 and 21 saying? They are basically saying that in bagging, if your models are very similar to each other, it's equivalent to having one model. You didn't do anything. Right? Because they're all repetitive. Even the aggregation doesn't add any value. But when the models are very different, the variance of estimation is divided by the number of models. We see this in the world too, in the real world. Assume you have a team, they're very similar to each other. How is it different than having one member in the team? But if we have too many different people in the same team, we'll have different ideas. Right? Mathematics explains real world life, too, right? So this is also called ensemble learning because we are doing, having an ensemble. Also called model averaging because you are averaging the models, right? We have three more minutes. So drop out, drop out. Drop out can be explained by bagging. So what is it saying, by the way? One example is random forest. Another one is dropout in neural networks. According to dropout, this is dropout. In every iteration of training phase, the neurons are randomly removed with some probability, usually half. Okay. So basically, I have some neurons in the network, right? Randomly in each iteration, randomly drop some of them. If you remove some of drop some of the neurons, the connections, the weights connected to those neurons are also removed in that iteration. Right? So we sample them with Bernoulli distribution. When you sample with, you flip a coin, it's like a Bernoulli distribution, right? With probability P. This makes the training phase as training different neural networks. In this iteration, I have one neural network. In another iteration, I have another neural network because I have dropped some other neurons. Basically, you are having K neural network models and you're having model average in between them. So you're having bagging of several neural networks. Interesting. This was dropout was proposed by Hinton et al. Right? Geoffrey Hinton. So in the test time, all neurons are used, but the output of the neurons is multiplied by P, the probability that you probability of dropping. Okay. This is, you can see it as model averaging. Can you explain it in another way without looking? Dropout does another thing too, in, a, in addition to bagging. So we know that according to bagging, what does it do? It divides the estimation of the variance of estimation by the number of models, right? It reduces the variance of estimation. That's one. Thing. Another explanation for why dropout works very well. When you drop some neurons, the waste connecting to those neurons are also dropped. What happens to the network? Well, less, complex. less complex or simpler, what? Reduce the overfitting, yes. A sparse, I was looking for a sparse. So it becomes like a sparse network, right? Many of the weights are dropped. And we know that the sparsity is good according to the Betin and sparsity principle and Occam's razor. Right, it becomes a spark. So it can be explained in two ways, sparsity and bagging. Acknowledgement, some slides are based on our tutorial paper, the theory behind overfitting cross-validation, regularization, bagging, and boosting. 
Some slides are inspired by the textbook of Hasey and Tipshirani, Elements of a Statistical Learning. Some slides are inspired by the textbook of Goodfellow, Benjo et al., Deep Learning. And other textbooks uh, suitable for sparsity in machine learning is by Tipshirani and Hasey et al., Statistical Learning with a Sparsity. Some slides also are inspired by teachings of Professor Ali Gotsi at the University of Waterloo. And these are the reference. Any question? No? Okay, thank you. So we finished regularization also today. And next uh, session, we have the midterm exam, right? And uh, just do your best without any stress. I, I want you to enjoy the exam. Enjoy the exam, okay? This course is not for evaluation. This course is for enjoy. You know, do your best. Do your best. Don't be, be lazy. Do your best and enjoy everything. And at the end, if required, I will care of the grades. <laughs> <laughs> so don't need to worry, okay? okay. Thank you. Thank you. After the exam, we will cover recurrent neural network, LSTM, attention, GPT, BERT, etc. Okay? Thank you.